Why don't we get started? So welcome everybody to the Citrus Research Exchange. Uh, my name is Ravi Namana. I'm the Executive Director here for uh, Services and for Healthcare. And we have a very exciting uh, talk for you today. Um, and, uh, but before I get into the particulars of the talk, uh, I'd like to thank Infineon for the very nice lunch that you're all enjoying. Um, and uh, one other thing here is to note that this is also being webcast at the other four, uh, other three Citrus campuses. Um, this is at UC Davis, Merced, and uh, Santa Cruz. So um, uh, there are a couple of rules with this. The first is that at the end of this talk, there'll be some time for questions and answers. And at that point, please wait for the microphone. If you don't speak into the microphone, your question can't be heard by all the other people who are viewing this. So please wait for the microphone to come to you, and then you can ask your question. Uh, and to you, Eric, if someone doesn't use a microphone, please repeat the question so okay. that the people in the field can get it. So um, now, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Eric Douglas, who is the leader of the CellScope project at UC Berkeley. Uh, it's a very intriguing project. I'll let uh, Eric give you the details on how it came about and, um, and, um, and what it's uh, all about. Uh, it's got a very intriguing title, CellScope, Mobile Imaging for Disease and Diagnosis. I've been fortunate enough to be uh, part of their lab meetings and watch this unfold. Um, uh, Eric's research focuses on micro devices for cellular analysis and point of care diagnostics for use in the developing world. Uh, he's actually just recently come back from the Congo, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he joined the CellScore project in summer of 2008, and he's directing the development and implementation of the technology for mobile microscopy in the developing world with Dr. Dan Fletcher in bioengineering. So please Joining me, join me and welcome Dr. Eric Douglas. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Ravi. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, yeah, so like Ravi said, I'm Eric. I uh, actually just, just finished my PhD over the summer, also here on campus in the bioengineering department and uh, with Rich Matthews. And now I'm doing, um, doing this project with Dan Fletcher. Dan is in D.C. He was supposed to be giving the talk, uh, but you get me instead and you get sandwiches. And so... We're all winners. Um, we, uh, we've been working on the project for over a little over a year, I guess, um, in, in uh, earnest. And so I've got some results of how, how far we've come and uh, a little bit of the vision for the project going forward. The basic idea is uh, so telemicroscopy. You've probably heard of you know, uh, telemedicine before, trying to do remote uh, diagnostic and analysis stuff. Doctors, you know, being able to have a webcam on their computer and, and diagnose what's wrong with the patient. But the way that, the way that uh, many things get diagnosed is with microscopy. And so what we want to do is be able to take, take that, you know, highest standard of, of diagnostic care and make it available throughout the world in a portable, easy-to-use, and inexpensive format. We're, we're calling that the cell scope. And this is, this is a schematic drawing of it here. And I'm going to get into some more of the details as we go forward. But just to start, you know, it's, it's easy to think about the, the technology and, you know, how it's, how it's really interesting and a lot of us are technologists, but it, it's, you know, important to remember why we do it. You know, there's, we're, we're working on um, diagnosis for infectious disease, uh, which has the highest impact in the developing world, and this guy has tuberculosis. And tuberculosis, we don't get much around here anymore, but it's, uh, it's one of the, the, the most deadly diseases in the world and actually kills over two million people every year. It kills someone every 20 seconds with tuberculosis. This guy has um, uh, extreme drug resistant tuberculosis. It's, there's this website xdrtb.org where I got the image. And X, XDR, extreme drug resistant TB, is, has been emerging because um, of, of ineffective treatment. You know, people often uh, are, are given drugs and they, they take them just long enough to feel better, but they're not actually cured and they stop taking the drugs, which allows the, the, the bugs to get stronger and mutate and be able, to get around the, be able to get around the drugs, and so they need to use you know, different drugs every time. And now there are, strains are, are getting worse that uh, are resistant to more and more of the, of the antibiotics that we have. So it's you know, just a, a point of motivation for, for diagnosis and, and monitoring. Being able to ensure that you know, we 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 do have medicine for a lot of these things, but a lot, a lot of times it's not applied well, and it's not you know the, the the course of therapy is what causes more harm both to the patient and on a on a public health level. So that's that's motivating us to to work on on diagnostics. Now 
within, within the, the sort of big three of infectious disease, we have tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV. Um, tuberculosis and malaria both kill about 2 million every year. HIV, AIDS, about 3 million every year. And the, the you know, um, morbidity rates uh, that you know, people that are actively sickened by the disease are also pretty staggering. 15 million a year for, for, for tuberculosis, 500 million a year for malaria. And uh, for, for two of the three of these, microscopy is, is the way to go. So you don't have to, to read very long in these papers before you come across microscopy as the gold standard, right? It's the, it's the thing against which all these other diagnostics are compared, uh, some, some other alternatives that I'm going to talk about later. But microscopy has been around the longest and is really the most trusted way for, for diagnosis of these diseases. Now, there are also you know, uh, um, PCR and, and cell culture techniques that are very important in confirming what the strain is and how you know, more, more detail on, on the specific disease that the patient has. But for the first-line diagnosis, uh, microscopy is, is really the gold standard. And that's, that's great if you have a microscope and if you have a doctor, but a lot of places have, have neither. Um, this is a map from the, from the UN Millennium Project, which is the sort of doctor density per, per thousand people. You can see there's a lot of doctors in the US and Europe, Russia, and uh, some of South America. But in a lot of places, especially Central Africa and Southern Africa, there are, there are very few doctors. There are, for example, Ravi mentioned that, that I was in Congo over the summer, and I'm gonna, gonna talk some more about that as we go on. But in, in Eastern Congo, where I was, um, there, there are one, one doctor per 160,000 people, which is pretty staggering. I mean, that's about the size of the city of Berkeley, right? If there was one doctor in the city of Berkeley, a lot of us are you know, pretty healthy and young and maybe don't go to the doctor a lot, but one, one doctor in the city of Berkeley would, would not give us very good health care. And that's, you know, that's, that's one doctor without, without the equipment he needs to, to do the diagnosis, without the you know, sanitary facilities for surgery, Anything else? There's, there's just just an overwhelming need for these tools. Now, microscopy is the is the tool we're we're working with. And microscopy is, has has uh, come a long way. I just just want to do a, a a brief story on microscopy because I think it it, it kind of motivates where we're going. Um, initially, there was this guy von Leeuwenhoek in the uh, 17th century. That, that developed the original tiny microscopes, these, these single lens microscopes. And it was just, there was a little, little glass sphere in here, and this is the sample holder. And it was, it was basically a magnifying glass, you know, it was a, a single lens microscope. But something this simple was, was what originally demonstrated the presence of, of microorganisms, like really opened the field of, of biology as a, an observational experimental science. And that, you know, this is, this is where it all started. And then we get into uh, some of these other devices. So these are, these are microscopes from the 17th and 18th century. It's, they became sort of microscopes as, a, as an object of art. You know, a lot of times the scientists were, were gentlemen dilettantes, and they would have these beautiful microscopes in their study and be able to you know, retire to work on some microscopy. But they were, they were really ornate, and you know, the, the, the imaging was uh, evolving. And then here we, have the, here we have the modern system. So this is from Zeiss. This is, a, this is a very expensive microscope. And this is kind of the way it's gone. So microscopes like this, you know, the, the ones that many of us have in our labs, easily $30,000 plus for, for you know, simple lab microscopes. And then when we start to add all the you know, single uh, or two photon, whatever stuff, it gets really expensive really fast. But you don't really need all that for a lot of this stuff. And so. Uh, this is, this is an, an adapted drawing with my crude Photoshop. Used to be a guy with a computer. Now it's a guy with a, a von Leeuwenhoek microscope, this, this simple microscope, because there's a, lot, a, there's a lot that can be done with these simple microscopes that maybe not quite that simple anymore, but that, that don't require this you know, huge level of, of capital investment to, to be able to still have high quality images. And you know, microscopy is both the gold standard and also sort of a gold equivalent that you know these microscopes are really expensive and since you know we have them in our labs here but they often are, are unaffordable even even the relatively simple ones are unaffordable at you know district and, and below hospitals in uh, in the developing world so 
what do we do? Well, here's, here's one alternative that people have been working on, these uh, rapid diagnostic tests. Now, you probably can't read that from, from where you are, but there are these strips, these rapid test strips, that often are an antibody-based system. And it's, uh, it's, a, it, it's a really nice idea because it doesn't require really any equipment. It, what they do is, you know, it's this little paper strip. You put on uh, a drop of blood and, um, you know, some, some buffer to wash it across. And as, as, as the blood goes on the pad, it uh, either, you know, if, if it has the antibody, so in this case, the, the, the blood has the antibody in it for the disease. So if it has the antibody that shows, you know, that, that they've been exposed to the disease, and uh, it, it flows across the strip, and it, it, it conjugates with this um, antigen and uh, label complex. So this, it's got a little silver particle on it and the antigen. And so as it flows across, you've got this antibody antigen label that's going to stick here. And then you've got some of just the plain um, uh, antigen and silver label that's going to capture on the, the control strip. So two lines. One's always going to show up just because you know, that, that, that shows the thing's working. And the other line's only going to show up if, if, you've got, you know, if you've been exposed to a disease. And it, it's a great idea. Um, it's you know, simple to use, doesn't require a lot of facilities. One, one drawback for, for this that you know, is also a drawback for a lot of other blood tests is the blood part of the blood test, that a lot of times the, the sanitation is, is you know, resource intensive, being able to, you know, there's no autoclave, there's not that many gloves, there's, you know, the, the standards of, of sanitation care are, are harder to um, realize. And so you know, anything blood related is, is potentially hazardous. But you know, this, this sort of gives a, a low enough exposure that, that um, you know, could be really useful. The problem is that a lot of times they don't work. Um, there was just a report that came out from the WHO where they analyzed, uh, uh, I think they were comparing in this case to, um, to tuberculosis microscopy. But, oh yeah, <laughs> that's what the quote says. Uh, Rapid blood tests for TB now on the market perform poorly in diagnosing active disease and cannot be recommended. So why, why do they perform poorly? Well, um, one main reason is that a lot of people have been exposed, and so they have the antibodies, but they may not have the active disease. And so, you know, they've got, they've got this soup of antibodies that, that are going to be either a false positive or some of the strips are, uh, you know, insufficiently specific, and so they get false negative or, you know, uh, fail to, fail to de detect the disease. So just sort of the context of, of where, where we are getting into the project is that there's a huge burden of disease, right? There's lots of people dying and a need for both new, new medicines and new diagnostic tests. But there's also, there's also uh, not a lot of doctors, not a lot of equipment to, to do these tests. The alternative diagnostics, these, these rapid tests, and some of the other things are, are not working. But there's one technology that, that is widespread, being adopted incredibly rapidly, and uh, is all, an already uh, robust network and uh, getting better every day, and that's cell phones. So, so cell phones kind of fits within the, the it part of Citrus. It's the, the IT, right? So IT in the interest of society, I mean, this is, c cell phones are, are exploding across, across the developing world at a much, much faster rate even than they are here. And they've been, they've been used for, for a ton of different applications. You know, there, a lot of places didn't have landlines, and so they're uh, installing the cell phone network just to leapfrog the landlines. Um, this guy on the left is a, is a fisherman in India who's calling around after having hauled in a bunch of fish to decide where's the best, where he's going to get the best price for his, for his catch. You know, so it informs business uh, fishing and farming. It's also a way that a lot of people uh, transact their banking, you know, credits can be, can be uh, done over the phone. Um, for, for healthcare, uh, doctors, if they are in a remote area, you know, sort of the, the very basic telemedicine, I've got this patient, he's got some problem, what do you think about it? He can call his friend somewhere else. And also, the, the, the hospitals, you know, don't tend to have the same sort of PA system that, you know, our hospitals have. And they, if, if you need a doctor in an emergency, you can call them on the phone. Um, and then on the right is, is sort of the other you know, out in the out in the village, um, for example, the the Grameen Bank has done a, a ton of work with this, giving small loans so that um, usually women can buy a phone and she becomes the the phone lady for the village. 
and uh, I think Pr Professor Brewer talked a little bit about this a couple weeks ago. Um, but these are just two examples of how, of how the cell phones are, are, are everywhere and, and becoming even more everywhere. Uh, the, the adoption rate, so you know, in the U.S., we, we doubled from 2000 to 2005. But in Africa, they went up by about a factor of 10 over five years. Um, cell phones are, are good and, and getting better. And so the, the, the thing we wanted to do was figure out how to, how to take advantage of that. You know, it's this, this one robust piece of infrastructure that we know is out there and that we know, you know can, can potentially meet this need. This is a, a scene on the street in uh, Congo where I was that, you know, a lot of the buildings were just covered in advertising for the, for the cell phone company, Vodacom, Celtel. There were a couple of companies, and, uh, you know, much like you might see beer ads plastered on other kinds of buildings, these are like, this is a supermarket that, um, you know, it's not a cell phone store, but just Vodacom is everywhere, and it's just such an omnipresent part of life. So here's our idea. It's a cell phone-based telemicroscopy where the patient and the healthcare worker out somewhere, somewhere remote, somewhere without the doctors or without the equipment, can uh, use our system and take the images, take, take these you know, micrograph images of the sample in the same way that we would in the hospital here. But if they, if they don't have you know, either the manpower or the expertise to do the analysis, it can, some of it can be automated on the phone and then other parts that actually need you know, a person to look at it, the images can be transmitted to a clinical expert somewhere else um, who will then do the diagnosis, send back the diagnosis to the, to the local health care worker and uh, you know, be able to, to affect that course of care as well as be able to do ongoing monitoring. You know, if it's, for example, in, in tuberculosis where they have DOTS, the directly observed therapy short course where someone goes out and watches the patient take his medicine, we could have, we could have a built-in sort of feedback system for, for the therapy. You know, someone could see how the drug is working, see if, if the you know, patient's disease load is being affected by it, and use that to affect uh, how the therapy is actually being carried out. So that was, that was the general idea for the project. And it, it actually originally grew out of a class that uh, Dan Fletcher was teaching. Dan there at the top right of the curly hair. Um, so it was uh, BioE 164, and uh, th this picture is actually from the semester where I was a TA for it. We, we analyzed these historical microscopes from uh, the, the Golub collection. The university has these, these bunch of really beautiful and interesting old microscopes, um, which was a fun project. The students took them apart, and they could see you know, how everything worked. And, but it, it, uh, it became apparent that you know, people were, were even more interested in doing something that was a little more timely. Um, so. Uh, Dan came up with the idea of, of doing this um, cell phone microscopy project. And this, this is actually not from the class. This is from a group that was, was working uh, you know, the, in, in the early stages of the project. But um, the, the idea grew out of this class. And we had the, or he had the students work on, work on this as their semester project, design uh, you know, a simple apparatus for being able to do microscopy on cell phone cameras. So that's the idea. Now, what, what do we actually, how do we test it? Um, Diagnostic microscopy usually looks like this. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's it's there, there, there's a it's some fluid, blood, sputum, mucus, something else. And um, I'll talk first about blood smears. So for malaria, um, they 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 take a blood smear. You know, it's a drop of blood. Uh, as you see on the top there, they smear it across the slide. They add some stain, and um, then observe it with microscopy. Now, all these things, you know. Are, Fairly resource intensive, but around here we have the resources. Uh, and if you have if you have a good stain, this is what it looks like. So these are these are the red blood cells, and within the red blood cells, you can see uh, the little P is the, the the parasites within the cell. So you can you can see they they stand out pretty clearly on this the, the, this high quality mic, uh, micrograph. This is from the New York State Department of Health. Um, but you know, being able to take high, high quality micrographs like that is not it's not a given. And then the other, the other aspect is, um, is tuberculosis. Now, tuberculosis is uh, analyzed in a couple of ways on the microscope. There's either this, this bright field technique, this, uh, it's called zeal Nielsen stain, which is what's mostly done in, in the developing world. Um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll give it the stain, they'll use the same sort of uh, bright field microscope illumination and be able to look for these little bugs. So you see the little, the little red uh, bacteria bacilli on the screen there. Um, 
a guy would you know, stain it, look at it, uh, look at a bunch of slides, look for the presence of those little bacteria, and that would indicate TB. Now you can see on the right how much easier fluorescence is. So fluorescence is the alternative stain. Um, it's, it's actually oramine is, is the name of the stain. And it's got a lot of advantages. It's more accurate. They, they get about 80% uh, accuracy in the diagnosis versus 60. It's cheaper to carry out, and it's uh, faster and requires lower magnification to be able to detect the bacteria, which is great if you have a fluorescence microscope, but a lot of people don't. A lot of fluorescence microscopes are expensive, and you know, so, so everybody's got in, 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 in the developing world this, the, the former technique. So we, we aim to be able to do uh, both, to, to, to be able to you know, enable both the fluorescence and the bright field microscopy. And this was our original sort of concept drawing, where we've got the, the, the cell phone here with the little sample holder, the, the slide holder. Um, so you can, you know, it's a, it's a uh, blood on the slide in the sample holder, and then um, just clipped onto the cell phone. Actually, w in, our, in our current prototypes, the, the adapter between the optics and the cell phone is, is based on a, a, a belt clip. So it's this like plastic belt clip you know, that you would buy at Fry's. And, uh, it drilled a hole in it so that you know it could be repurposed as a, an optics adapter, so the hole goes right to where the camera is. And we started. So this is this is the uh, the original prototype sort of drawing where, you know, before before building up a you know an integrated system, we did this this breadboard type system where you've got the illumination, you've got you know the the the, the sample, these lenses at the right places, and then down here the cell phone with the camera. And built on that to uh, come up with this, the actual integrated phone-based prototype that I was talking about. So this is, this is the high magnification version. Now it's, it's got a, a tube lens about this long, um, or tube length about this long, so that uh, it's got the right, you know, right spacing for the, for the uh, lenses, the sample holder at the end, and uh, yeah, an actual hand, an actual phone. Now, you can't quite tell from the, from the depth, well maybe you can, but it kind of looks like a gun. <laughs> which, which uh, didn't didn't do me any favors in customs when I was when I was carrying this thing through. It got it got over fine, but when I was coming back, uh, I was in the the airport in Nairobi, and I, I I actually wasn't watching my own bag at that point. I had given it to a friend to hold on to, and so he took my bag through security, and he didn't really know much about the project, and had to kind of scramble to explain that it's a microscope and it's don't worry, don't worry, it's fine, and it it made it on the plane, so that was good. Um, and this is the low magnification, uh, so significantly less gun-like, um, and also you know, different applications. So this is more of a, a 5X type thing if you had a, a skin condition or some other applications that, that require less magnification, but still some, you know, that, that wouldn't quite work with just the camera, but being able to do low mag for analysis. So uh, let's see some actual analysis. Um, so here's, this, is a, this is a picture of just a, a normal blood smear. On the right, you can see uh, the, the image with the standard microscope. This is a, a, a black and white version. But then on the left, you can see the image taken with the cell scope. They're, they're, they're really pretty identical. I mean, you, you can see the, the sort of donut shape of the uh, red blood cells. You can you know, easily detect the ones that are up on the edge and everything. Like it's, we're, we're getting equivalent imaging quality with the cell phone camera in this case as we do with our standard microscope. And so that, this one's a healthy blood smear. Now, next up, we wanted to look at some actual d disease conditions and see if, if we could really pick them out based on our, our images on, on the camera. Um, so in this case, it's, it's sickle cell disease. And if you look, you know, the, the arrows point to a couple of these cells that are, are sickled. So this, this, again, would have given us a significant um, uh, or uh, sufficient image quality to be able to do the diagnosis. Sickle cell disease is great, but it's not one of the big three, but malaria is. So, so malaria, um, this is an image that we did in the, in the you know, way I described before, where you, you do the, the standard bright field staining for malaria. And then uh, within many of these cells, you can see the little darker blue dots, and that indicates the, the malaria parasite. So malaria was, was more of a, a magnification and optical challenge that we've been able to successfully image on the system. Now, those are both examples of, uh, of, of bright field imaging. Uh, the, the sickle cell and the malaria, you know, we've got um, it's just a light shining through. Uh, you know, you could do it by holding it up to the sun, actually, as, as many of the images were, so that it doesn't 
require a lot of you know, expensive illumination. But um, as I was saying with the, with the tuberculosis, really the best way to do it is with fluorescence. And not only tuberculosis, but some other diseases. Tuber uh, uh, fluorescence would be just a, a, a tremendously powerful asset to this, to this system. So we did it. Um, so here we have uh, a, some, some tuberculosis samples that um, Wilbur Lamb, uh, who's a doctor at UCSF and one of the guys on our team, got from, from, the, UC, or from the, the UCSF TB clinic. These are real patient samples that we looked at both on the standard microscope and on the cell scope. And so it doesn't maybe look like much. You know, it's a black field with some little, little green spots. But these images would be all, all you would need to, to diagnose tuberculosis. Um, and we've, we've been able to, to take these high quality images right on our device. So that's, all that stuff is, is kind of the imaging capability side of it, right? But that's, so that's, that's microscopy, but not telemicroscopy. So now getting back to the idea of the telemicroscopy, this is a, a screenshot from our website that we're working on where we can get the phone, you know, get the, get the cell scope system to automatically upload the image uh, over, over the cell network um, and put it, on, put it on the web so that these remote doctors or you know, uh, pathologists can analyze the image. So in this case, you know, we've got another, another blood smear. This is, uh, I think, another malaria blood smear. And uh, you know, somebody remotely, in this case, a couple of the guys on our team, Robbie and Jesse, have, have gone through and, and manually annotated a couple of the, a couple of the you know, uh, cells that, that have the malaria parasites in them. And that you know, illustrates that, that we can both get, get a, a you know, good enough quality image, send it over, and integrate it into this you know, uh, remote diagnostic framework. So having, having done all that, having shown that you know, the thing works in the lab here, that we can, get, we can get the imaging to work, we can get the transmission to work, um, we decided to do some very preliminary uh, field work. So I, was, I went um, last summer to Congo, and uh, I was in, so Congo, right here in the middle of Africa. Uh, you got your Rwanda, Burundi, and so on. Um, the, the city I was in was called Goma, and Goma is, is right on the border of Congo and Rwanda. And uh, Goma's had a lot of problems. Um, well, I mean, Congo overall has, has had a lot of problems, especially in the, in the last 10 years after the aftermath, or in the aftermath and, and following of the genocide in Rwanda, um, it's been called the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. There have been five million people that have died in, in that ongoing conflict, people displaced from their homes and people that, um, you know, not like not not always an act of fighting, a lot of times just as a, as a result of the act of fighting, but it's just a, a humanitarian disaster and a place where, where there's you know, all, all of these needs and, and, and more. And so it was a, it was a, a good place to be able to, to you know, gauge the interest and do some initial assessment and, and field testing. But Goma's also, so this is, this is from the house I was, was staying at. It's on the, on the shore of Lake Kivu, one of uh, Africa's Great Lakes in the Great Lakes region which I really liked, being from Michigan, America's Great Lakes region. I felt an immediate kinship with, with the people of Goma. And uh, so it's on this beautiful lake, but it's also at the base of this giant volcano. This giant volcano, Mount Nairagongo, erupted in 2002. It wiped out most of the city. Um, the city is still covered in, in lava rock. The roads are lava rock. And you know, a lot of the houses, the cinder block houses, have like lava rock or you know, dried lava up three or four feet on the side of the house. Um, so there's not only the, you know, the, the presence of this still smoldering and active volcano just looming over the city, but also the ongoing conflict, the, these, these militia groups that live just outside the city. And as a result of both, uh, huge um, uh, numbers of, of internally displaced people and also refugees from elsewhere that, that live in these camps that are... So one of these huts is a is about as big as, as this table. You know, it's, it's, uh, the size is constrained by the size of the tarp that the UN passed out, because when it rains, you don't want to get rained on. And so in, in one of these huts, there's eight people, you know, usually about a family of eight people living. Um, it's just pretty overwhelming. But there's also a lot of good stuff going on there. Um, this is just a, a quick plug for the, for the group I was working with. They're called Heal Africa. And uh, Heal Africa is a, a, an NGO that um, started there and w was, was started by, by local Congolese people and um, continues to be supported by both them and, and international people. But uh, 
they're, they're just doing amazing work. So a lot of the, a lot of the violence um, or a lot of the uh, medical need that they see is, is due to sexual assault. It's a, it's a huge problem in the, in the ongoing war there and that's like most of their surgeries is, is repairing damage in, in violent sexual assault. And uh, so, so the place is, is filled with these people awaiting surgery, people with a variety of other diseases, tuberculosis, malaria, and so on. Um, little kids running around carrying each other on their backs. And uh, this is one of the things I like. They're, they're very resourceful in the construction. So this is, you can see the Costco on the top there. That's the, you know, Costco, the Chinese shipping company that uh, they, they, they built this workshop building out of um, repurposed uh, shipping containers. So, you know, it's kind of like using every part of the buffalo. And so the, the aforementioned volcano, here's me on top, right there. I could look down in and see the, see the lava. It was, it was one of the more sort of Lord of the Rings experiences in my life thus far. It, it, very remote, very, you know, like, kind of stand there and think, how did I get here? What am I doing on top of this volcano? Smell the sulfur. And, and, and yet, the, the cell phone coverage there was perfect. We, were, you know, we got up to the top, and then we called, called down to our friend who was going to come and pick us up. I, I was pretty surprised because I can't get signal in, in Stanley. You know, but, but on top of this volcano, perfect signal. I could have been diagnosing myself with any number of things. So, so, so w while we were there, I, I got to go around to, to some, of the, uh, some of the TB labs that are actually doing the work. Um, this is the, the regional TB lab in Goma. And the, the regional TB lab, they, this is like not just the regional TB lab, but really the only TB lab. These are the guys that deal with all the TB cases, which there are lots, in this place where there are millions of people. And it's, just, it's like one guy in a microscope and some, you know, some dye and a, a slide rack and just working really hard all day and surrounded by people coughing with tuberculosis. Um, so I, I, got to, I got to do some demos and this is just me uh, holding the cell scope with, with a couple of the other uh, doctors and, and technicians at, at the uh, regional hospital there. And, you know, I mean, obviously they do have some technology, right? There's this, this light box here for looking at x-rays. There were some other things. There was, there was a, um, a cell counter in the other room that wasn't working. They didn't have the reagents for. There's a lot of, a lot of things that, you know, expensive technology that, that gets donated and ends up either breaking or not working or, you know, not like there's, there's no service available for it. There's no reagents. There's whatever. Um, you know, things that are intended really well that, you know, would, would work great in the lab here just don't end up working a lot of times. And so there was, there was a real interest in, in our device, its you know, simplicity, and as, 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 as well as some of the other applications. You know, they were always suggesting, like, well, can I hook this up to, you know, my other microscope? Can I do this? Can I do that with it? You know, and it was, it was cool to, to give them a tool that, you know, we had, we had you know, clear, clear intentions for and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do what we've intended it to do but is also sure to be used for a variety of other things that, that we can't even envision at this point. So there, there are a couple of steps, though, in the process, right? There's, there's the analysis part, which we've done a lot of work on, take, you know, taking the pictures, sending the pictures, having somebody look at it. But the part I haven't talked about is the, the sample prep part, which isn't trivial. You know, you have to, the, like for the blood smear, you have to get the blood, you have to smear it. You know, there's a lot of handling, there's a lot of, you know, reagent interaction, there's the, the simpler we can make this, the better. You know, the less exposure people have to, p to potentially hazardous blood, the less um, training and, and expertise someone needs to use it, you know, makes it a much more usable technique for someone who's had very little, ver very little uh, training or, or background in it. And so this is, this is the uh, broader shot of the lab, the, the TB lab there, where you, know, you can see like there's not, it's not like there's a couple of guys whose job it is, is you know, work on this preparation. If we, could, if we could make it easy, we can really help people. You know, we can help to, to direct the therapy for these people with TB. So this is one of the guys in our group, um, David Breslauer just presented this at Microtest. This is a, uh, a microfluidic device that we've been working on to try and ease the, the sample preparation step. So what, 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 what these are, are uh, a PDMS um, you know, silicone rubber molded into some pattern and then uh, put on a glass slide. Many of you have probably worked with before. And in this case, in the, in the first one, it's just for loading, right? The, uh, if you put a, a drop of 
of blood or some sample on there, it'll, it'll wick through the channel by capillarity. So you don't need to have any pumps or any other you know, more complicated technology to load it. Um, and it'll, it'll load into these, uh, he's got five little uh, viewing windows there of the cells. And so those are, those are designed to be the same scale as the, the field of view for the cell scope so that we could just you know, uh, easily integrate that into the cell scope system. And then the other two are you know, being able to put both the, the sample and some stain into the two different wells and have them wick in together and mix through this, this uh, serpentine channel such that you know, they'll be able to mix up together. The sample will be stained and again go into the little observation reservoir and uh, you'll be able to, to take the images. So the idea with this is, is to make it as simple as possible, to make it as you know, sort of user friendly, plug and play as we can. And this is, this is uh, some of the data that we've got from, from working with this. So, you know, on the, on, on the left, it's just food coloring. But as, as we go across, it's the same sample. We took um, a you know, sample of the cells, loaded it into the device. And you can see that we've got the image that, that we attained with the microscope. And uh, then further on the right, the image that we attained with the cell scope. So we get the same quality of, of image to be able to do you know, all these applications and on this very simple device. Now, it's, we're, we're, we're comparing it to a hemocytometer, which is the standard technique for, for cell counting. And um, it uses very little sample. And it also, there's, there's a question with, with some of these microfluidic devices about you know, flowing the cells through. Are they going to clump up? Are they going to, you know, is, it, is, this, is this really going to be reflective of what, um, and what the actual cell count is? So David did some more experiments where uh, you know, he took, took a cell sample of, of some known concentration and uh, analyzed the, the samples with both the hemocytometer and the cell scope and did you know, the, the cell counting and found that, found that the, the, the cell scope and hemocytometer both gave about the same result within, you know, within the margin. And uh, you know, so, so there wasn't anything, any you know, real concern about dealing with the cell aggregation or anything in the devices. He also is, is beginning to work with some of the um, automatic counting, which will be an interesting direction. So we've, we've shown that, that it works with, works with the standard tech, or works as, as well as the standard technique, and that you know, it, it actually does, it has been validated for the counting. So that's, that, that's pretty much it. Um, the idea, as, as I said before, is, is to do this uh, remote telemicroscopy. And you know, just to just to sort of sum it up, like we think that what what we're developing and, and what we've we've already done so far, we've got the uh, the sample prep, the image capture, um, we're able to do some basic analysis and transmission, and we've also integrated the uh, the offsite analysis into this portable and user friendly system. And the, and the portability is a big part of it. I haven't really talked about that, but I mean it's you know it's this big, right? It, it we can. We can carry it through customs in Kenya. We can carry it in a canoe up the Congo River. So these places where the, where the diseases are, are you know, going to be last to be eradicated, likely. I mean, a lot of these diseases, there, there, there are big international efforts to try and get rid of malaria, get rid of TB. And it, you, know, you might be able to get rid of it in, in some well-staffed hospital, but in some remote village, nobody's probably going there. And if they do, they need to be able to carry things that are you know, easy, easy to carry and easy to use. And so. We've made a lot of progress on that, and that's, that's something that, that we're continuing in our refined prototypes. Um, so our next steps are, are to continue to refine the prototype to, to make a, a device that is more integrated, um, to, to do some more robust field testing, where we actually do a side-by-side -side comparison of our technique and the, the standard techniques in the hospital. And uh, hopefully, we can, can continue to grow it and, and get it up to the scale of deployment. So let me just acknowledge uh, some of the team who've been working on it. Um, the people on the left, uh, Dan, myself, Wilbur, Robbie, Neil, uh, David, Jesse, and, and Ravi as well. And uh, some of the people who have given us support so far, um, the Blum Center, uh, Citrus, thanks Citrus, uh, Microsoft, uh, the Big Ideas Fund, um, the White Paper Competition, and Dean Sastry. So we saw a lot of monkeys in Congo. and. Uh, I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Eric. 
Um, so we have time for a few questions, and again, please wait for the microphone to come to you, and there's uh, Yvette is uh, coming up there. I'll take this question first while the microphone comes, so let's keep it quick. Thanks. Uh, excellent talk. I have two questions, uh, one detail and one high level. Uh, how do you have any details on how you performed the fluorescence um, uh, experiment on the TB detection, and also is what's the average cost of these devices? So the, uh, the, the, f the fluorescence on the TB is, is something that we've just kind of been working on. Um, so it's not, it's not a very refined system for that illumination, but we've, we've been using LEDs for the, for the fluorescent illumination. And the, and the cost is, you know, it really depends on the application. I mean, a lot of them can, can be made more inexpensively, you know, especially the low mag. Um, but, and, and especially once you add the fluorescence, it gets a lot more expensive. So without the fluorescence, you know, probably two or three hundred with maybe six or seven. Question in the back. As long as you're digitizing these, these images, what about the possibility of using pattern recognition to diagnose TB or, uh, or, or malaria or whatever, and it'll just eliminate the clinician or at least use them for just a confirmation? It would certainly be quicker and a lot cheaper. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think that would be great. Um, and and if, if anybody in the room is a pattern recognition expert that wants to join the team, we'd we'd love to to talk with you after. Um, in in a lot of cases, that that would really help, especially with with you know the, some of the fluorescent images where it's a clear kind of binary image. In in some that are more complicated, I think people are are gonna at, at least you know in order to to satisfy the WHO, satisfy the people who are you know wanting to compare it to the standard techniques, it'll probably have to be eyes for a while. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Over there, please. Are there any plans to uh, patent this process technology for uh, and, and make it commercial? Yeah, well, um, we, we actually uh, just talked to them. <laughs> we're we're uh, filing it through the, the OTL on campus. Uh, up here. I'm just uh, <clears throat> wondering, how dependent is the system on the resolution of the cameras inside the cell phones? So in this case, we've been working with um, relatively higher end uh, cameras with, with three megapixel sensors, which is lower than we'd have you know, in the lab, but higher than a lot of standard cell phones have. Um, you know, as you can see, there was, there was plenty of resolution for all those images. So we could easily, I think, get it down by you know, a couple of, me you know, down, to, down to standard cell phone resolution. And that's what, that's what we originally started on in the class and, and got good, good images out of that. Um, but I mean, cell phone cameras are, are getting better, and you know, in a couple of years, they'll you know we'll 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 have higher resolution sensors. I think standard in a lot of cameras. Other questions. All right. Um, we'll please thank. Uh, join me in thanking Eric for his kind talk, and thank you, Eric. Thanks. And we're adjourned.